Hi, this is Uncle Matt's d d Studio. I'm Matt Finch, and if you play Dungeons & Dragons, and especially old-school Dungeons & Dragons, please hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the channel, and now we'll move on to the video. The The topic we're on now is uh, my campaign, because I want to just bounce some ideas uh, off of, of, of Zach. But on this is that I knew I was going to start one up for the online game. Uh, I ended up taking a trip to southern Spain because my mom had somebody she was going with and then it, that person had to cancel. So I went along to Spain and ran into, uh, I knew nothing about southern Spain other than the fact that it was occupied by the Moors, you know, at some point during the, the Dark Ages. And then all of a sudden when you're there, it, so, it hits you that there's this, you know, whole, this was a, a non-Arabic Islamic culture that had its own stuff and you know you're sort of overwhelmed with a lot of the visual stuff and so i was like okay what if i take this and i'm going to try and uh, write it like it's uh, michael moorcock and i'm going to try and visualize it like it's errol otis um and and run with that and uh so i've got the uh, the mega dungeon i've got uh the main city called jordaba which is based on you know cordoba which i mispronounced my entire life thinking it was cordoba but it's cordoba um so if you were going to be starting a campaign with that sort of idea of written by Michael, Michael Moorcock, visualized by Errol Otis, uh, what are some of, and, and then sort of set in a kind of North African uh, schematic, what kind of stuff springs to your mind with that? Well, uh, for me, uh, uh, the Islamic architecture of, of Southern Spain uh, has a lot of, like a lot of the architecture and and art of that of of the Islamic cultures is is based on the idea of like there's a sort of assumption of desert and basically a monumentality on top of that and the intricate design. But then the stuff in Spain is more the assumption is a tropical and and mountainous landscape. And so there's terraces and fountains are what I think of. Like mm -hmm. um like the the lion fountain is like four it's like four lions like north south east west and they're all spitting it, it is is beautiful is be absolutely staggeringly beautiful and i think that that the the setup of like you know there's a sort of uh, a terrace or a, a hilltop and then like below it another one and below it another one and then maybe back up again because it's mountainous um and uh and also these ideas about water because it's tropical like there's there's like the flow of water how water is going to be moving if you've got a fountain and it's got if it's got four lions in a fountain like that's just like you know you've got like four directions north south east west and they got four different kinds of water coming out of their mouths and maybe they spin and it's a puzzle like that just right by itself is already kind of an image that you know is and then of course like your mecca is over here then you're trying to like pray towards mecca and then but also things tend to be a little bit squatter and lower, lower ceilings than a lot of uh, Islamic architecture and, and a wide uh, like horizontality, um, like big plazas. I, I would kind of almost go in a sort of Tecumel direction where you have like this sort of sophisticated court culture of broad open spaces and public life that maybe gets buried you know um, yeah we've got um i'm doing the plazas and part of this is actually um directly relevant because the way i'm doing it is i'm running uh i'm, I'm using minis and scenery and i'm running the camera through it you know at the minis eye view so you're actually seeing uh the terrain and so it's sort of you know it's it's certainly not uh high quality it's clunky but it's sort of like a, a b movie this is what the miniatures are seeing oh yeah that's fun you know. and, and, and so actually, you know, this stuff comes in now what, and so I definitely have worked in the plazas and um, I broke deliberately the horizontal um, type of element, except for the fact, you know, you've, you've often got um, long galleries in there, which were, you know, for shade a lot of the time and also just yeah. part of the decor on it. Um, but except for that, um, I've been working with the sort of idea of, um, using much more verticality you know the, the sort of european city 
where you had multiple stories of things, I've been thinking, what if you had sort of an almost irregular piling of levels, you know, sort of like, well, no, that doesn't work. Okay. Sort of like this, you know, where you've got, you know, building stories moving up vertically. And part of the reason for that is that, you know, like you said, it being very rugged, um, it, it's astonishingly rugged. And so the, 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 um, you've got stuff that's really, really uneven. And so what I was thinking of the way to view it was get, getting that sort of crowded um, Arabian like the atmosphere. favela kind of thing. Say again? The favelas in Brazil. Okay, now that, tell me what that is, because that's not something I'm familiar with. You ever see the Hulk movie where he ends up in Brazil? Maybe it was the beginning of the Avengers, but... Like it's basically there. There are these there are these slums uh, in the outskirts of the cities in in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, I think, where they're just like, it's a mountain, it's a hill, and then there's just homes built into the hill, like piled on top of each other, basically. So there's sort of like these like like di diagonal slums where there's just like alleyways up and stairs constantly, just like buildings stacked up on building. But if you Google, yeah, Venezuela, you can definitely get um that uh, idea of what that looks like you know so it's a city but it's a city that goes up the side of the hill and it's just hyper dense it's it's far more denser than like uh than like san francisco or anything it's like just like building next to building and they're all kind of piled on top of each other at irregular angles and no building codes and all that yeah that's uh, that's a lot what i was thinking of only instead of even having the natural there, there's no natural feature doing that here it's the entire mountain uh, is the is the houses and then there's the sort of valleys and, and slopes because I don't want to you know you've got the ha having narrow canyons is almost a science fiction sort of um, effect and so I was thinking you know having them sort of spreading outward through the city um, one of the one of the difficulties that I ran into is I was like okay yeah I'm going to use Errol Otis sort of thing and then I stopped and thought and it's like Errol Otis does all there, there's not a straight line in anything that Errol does and so it's right. like you know I can't my Hearst Arts blocks are not going to do this I'd, I'd have to get clay and I don't have that skill level so <laughs> well I mean if you you're trying to get sort of wobbly a wobbly look um you know you could you could I guess you know I mean the thing about clay is that you can just chop it, you know, like it's a big piece of cheese or something, you know, like into these uh, shapes. So you're not really shaping the clay. You're just, or even like they have actually so many alternatives to clay these days, like uh, better things. Like there's stuff that's even better than Sculpey now. It's just like you shape it and then you don't even have to bake it. It just air dries. Uh, so there's probably stuff that you could get where you just like get a knife and you have put this block down and you get a knife and you go, whoa, whoa. And you cut it, and there you go. Um, let me see if I can get you. Let's see here. In screen well, I, here. I got some. I got some Crayola um, air dry stuff, which is probably not the artist's quality. Um, but you don't need it. it, right? I mean, you don't need the artist's quality, right? There's okay. a. That's what like you know the really photogenic favelas look like. Um, like those are obviously ones that have been painted up for some kind of festive thing, but like just like. With that, like the normally, this is kind of what they look like. Am I screen still screen Holy right shit. Yeah. Okay. Let me, yeah. You talk for a second, so it'll show that. Yeah. Um, but basically, you know, you can see that just like the, the, the hill is almost gone. It's just completely like these like slums. And these are made without any kind of like these are just made by whoever made them. You know, like each one is like homemade essentially. Uh, uh, and this is all illegal basically uh but it's there's there's no other place for these people to live like they live in the favelas and they uh they work in the city um but yeah you can just see the level of of craziness of the the alleys and the the angles the hard thing is like mapping these things in a game almost the best way to map them is with a photo you know like you take a picture like this uh -huh. and, and like actually just be like you know, like, you know, maybe turn it black and white or sepia in, and then just like, you know, get, get one without too many telephone wires and be like, okay, like this is here. Or you could, you know, you could probably do a bunch of processes too, like trace it or whatever, but basically be like, you know, this is what you're looking at. Where do you go? It's this neighborhood. And then people could like point like, oh, the blue tarp or, you know, 
whatever um because they're kind of unmappable because there's so much 3d stuff involved but yeah the favelas are amazing they're um i mean obviously they're a social huge like desperate crime ridden area but they're also really beautiful and kind of a monument to the creativity and uh will to stay alive of these people but like this is like total you know fascinating landscape you know yeah, like, it is. It's a lands landscape in and of itself. Yeah. One, I mean, of, one of the best... Take one of those photos, sorry, be like, this sorry, is... You, uh, you could just key the photo. You know, just be like, this is here, this is here, that's there, you know? Yeah. Which I, I probably... Well, yeah, I couldn't do it with the online game, really, but what? speaking of doing that, I mean, what, the last time, the last session we had, you know, I just built the dungeon... Um, right beforehand you know just putting it together in rooms and then i at, at the end of it i took a picture from the top down <laughs> so i was like okay now i'm gonna put numbers on this thing because uh, yeah i mean if you just send people a photo you know or send people a picture like email them or screen share it and just be like what do you you know a b c d e i actually ran like a, a bunch of play by player versus player games that way where you know like i would take a photo of like a, a mordheim or you know like some other like somebody had made a miniature landscape you know, and I just keyed the, the letters to each one, like a, a through J or Z or whatever, and just be like, okay, you're at B, you're at C, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? And it actually worked pretty well. You just go, oh, I'm going to C, or I'm going to go to B via L or, you know. Yeah. One of the best um, games I ever had in a tactical sense was actually, uh, it was an Old West game, and for it, for some reason, you know, wild hair reason. I, I made some old West buildings and because they all had the balconies, I put in balconies. And as it turned out, having um, the, the ability to think in the three dimensions led to some really, really fun stuff going having, on. Like, that. yeah, having a lot of vertical things and, and deadfalls is great because like it's a day, it's an obstacle, but also it's just like a cheap way to weaponize any situation. It's like, you know, can you push somebody off the ledge or can, do, I can, if I jump, will you catch me? Like just getting a stuff with a lot of like, that is, it's, it's a dumb trick, but it, it's a simple trick anyway, but it actually is like super effective. It's just like having, having a clear idea of like up and down, you know? Uh, well, any 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 trick that is very effective is not a dumb trick when it comes down to it. It's just a simple thing to remember that that you it's easy to forget. Like you know, just like use the verticality, and you will get it. Kind of doubles or triples the amount of tactical fun and complexity you get out of any kind of environment. Yeah, I, I think, and and one of the things about doing it with minis too is that uh, when you are thinking about three-dimensional stuff when you're talking about theater of the mind it gets harder and harder to visualize which means you um, are not likely to take advantage and here i'm talking about the players they're they're less likely to take advantage of something than if they see okay there is a balcony here because you know a lot of the times i'm like theater of the mind you know you get a much better visualization of things but um, for the for the structural side having an actual representation of the third dimension worked really well mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely the more you see those things, the more you, you, you become, especially players who aren't instinctively that way, you know, they get ideas. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm finally starting to run dry after doing, you know, two and now a half things. So uh, if you're not dry, run with it. Huh, what are we going to run with? Um, Actually, I got a question. The the tattoo on the back of your hand is a lot like one of those labyrinth oh, tattoos yeah. or the or the uh the aborigine uh stuff from Australia. Where's what where's that from? It's not from anything. It's just like something I drew when I was younger. It's just like I mean, every tattoo is something you literally got when you were younger. But, you know, it's just sort of a spirally shape and I just like I was, you know, getting a hand tattoo and I was like like what's something that's sort of uh just visually absorbing, you know, it's like, Oh, it's a spiral. Like, Whoa, look into my, you know? Uh, yeah. Well, those, those are, I mean, I really, I really like the, uh, uh, you know, the stuff that's done that way, you know, the, the, the labyrinth and then, you know, that stuff really is, you know, 
something about it just draws your eye. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it. you know, you kind of like, no, oh, what is that? You know, um, this one is the armor classes by by armor type. It's hard to. <laughs> <laughs> so literally a cheat sheet on your arm, drawn on your yeah, arm. Yeah, because I just like that's the one thing you do end up looking up over and over. Uh, so this this column is the first column is the AD&D and the second column is fifth edition uh, armor classes. So it's got. Hot, like, let me see if I can hide leather, scale mail, half plate, ring mail, etc. Like, so yeah, that's 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 just awesome. So, oh, here's another question. Um, fifth edition, you were one of the consultants that Wizards of the Coast brought in, and yeah. so you are one of the people, uh, you know, who gets the credit for the fact that it actually walked back. Uh, a lot of the granular rulemaking and got a lot more old school uh, than the earlier editions. Um, talk about that. I mean, what did you do with them? Were you trading manuscripts back and forth or what? Um, basically, I mean, they're, basically what would happen is they would send me whatever draft they were working on and they'd be like, here, what are your thoughts? And then like, here are a few things that we are kind of were like, what do you think of the, you know, they were very general. Like, what do you think of the spells? Is there anything missing? You know, stuff like that. Um, and I would send back, you know, a long email. And then if there was anything that it was with Mike Merles mostly. So it was just back and forth with Mike. If there was anything that was like, that was sparked something that he was specifically thinking about, he would write back about mostly about that. And these were long emails. Um, and I remember like, I think, a lot of this stuff, it's hard to tell the effect because there's stuff that they took out. Like, I'd be like, like the original thing with Wizards was like they had a, a version of Wizards where basically you always wanted to have a wand. Like, because if you had a wand, it would be better. And I was like, this is just Harry Potter. Like, if people want to play Harry Potter, they're going to make a Harry Potter game sooner or later. And there's a Harry Potter video game. Like, don't make, if people want to play D&D, &D, like, that's its own thing. Like, you know. And then they, they took it out. But I don't know if they took it out because I said that or because everyone said that or because it was just a dumb idea of the first draft, you know? Um, I think the longest conversation we had was about difficulty classes. And Mike said that that was the conversation that eventually led to advantage-disadvantage. Because... Really? Because that's that's one of the more uh, yeah. the more interesting parts of the, of, of the system. I, I don't know. I don't know necessarily more interesting, but it's a, it's a really neat... Um, yeah. I mean, mechanic for going around mathematics. Yeah, and it also is just sort of you can use it in any game. It's simple and compact, and um, but basically that mechanic was uh, that was a curse in Death Frost Doom was essentially disadvantage. Uh, so James Raggi had thought of it, but before that, it had been in a bunch of war games uh, as a mechanic for various things: roll twice and pick the highest or lowest. Um, but our conversation that we had that was probably the longest was he was like talking about difficulty classes and he was like, well, what if you have the GM say what they want to do and then, um, and then you like figure out difficulty from there. And I'm like, well, the problem with that is in a sandbox environment, you can't really do that because then you can't pick your, pick your, uh, like risk reward level, you know, like as a player, you'd be like, well, this, it's hard to break into this place, but there's a lot of reward and it's easy to break in this place. So this has a DC of six and this is a DC of 16. You know, you want that, you want players to have that agency of like, you know, and he's like, yeah. Um, so we had a lot of conversations like that, uh, that went back and forth. Um, and I think that there's, there's two theories about uh, me being involved in fifth ed. Like, well, first one is like, Mike read my blog and he like was like, yeah, we might as like we might as well chip this guy like enough money that it costs to write some emails and if he has a good idea, good. And the other one is that he was consciously trying to get the fan base on board with the game or certain sections of it. And he was like, Well, Zach is a certain section of the fan base listens to him, so let's tell him he's involved. And then, you know, well, no matter what, you know, like we'll say you were consulted, you know. Um, either way though, either a, I had a lot of impact on 5e or they, uh, told me I did, but didn't really, either way, they deserve me saying I had a lot of impact on 5e, you know, like either I did, or they were humoring me either way. The appropriate thing for me to do is to claim a lot of credit. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> and, well, and but I honestly feel like the like I was shocked how happy I was with it, even though there's lots of things about it I would change. Like I feel like the library content, which is where AD and D beats like every game, or at least every D and D. It's just like you know the library content, the spells and the monsters, and just the 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 stuff that you access. You know, like the that you that you grab and pull into the game, like the options. Uh, of of stuff were so beautifully written in a lot of cases, or at least intriguing and interesting, you know. And there wasn't a lot of new stuff like that, at least in, you know, the, the basic stuff. You know, like the spells were, there were spells that, like, they have a lot of them are clearly like, this spell is supposed to like, last the length of a fight, which I think is not a good call. I think that spells should sometimes, like, stop, like, when it's inconvenient, or they should go too long that it's convenient and it screws things up, like... You know, so they they basically like they didn't go too far afield with those things, and I and I think that that's where you would kind of be let down a little bit as a if you were an old school gamer. And then just the power levels were high, you know, like, uh, and so you know you start off like there's nobody who has D four hit points at the beginning, and so it's hard, to, you know. And then they had cantrips, but there, but every single thing that uh, wasn't what I liked was pretty easy to hack. Um, so it's really easy to rewrite fifth ed so that uh, you know wizards start with d4 hit points and thieves start with d6 hit points, you know, and it's pretty easy to get rid of cantrips and still have a pretty playable game. Um, yeah, that was that was one of the difficulties I, uh, that I had with third edition was that it was all so interwoven um, that you did one thing in one part of it and it was going to collapse something in another part and, and, and fifth edition. I th fifth edition has done, I think, um, I think it's gotten a really good reception among old schoolers. I mean, they're, oh, yeah. they're, um, you know, there's nothing like the edition wars that were going on with, with third edition. There are a lot of old schoolers who are saying, Hey, you know, I'm playing a second, you know, fifth edition campaign and, and, and nobody, nobody, uh, takes up torches or pitchforks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing about it is that people kind of know what they're getting. You know, like if you're playing Labyrinth Lord or Swords and Wizardry, and then you go and play 5e, 5e is like, you're going to be a little bit more powerful, and the spells are going to be a little bit more uh, intense, and then they are, you know? Like, you get, you know, like, but it's not a whole different ball game in terms of how do you play the game. Advantage, disadvantage is a mechanic that you could import to like any game. So it's like, oh, that was good. Um, and I, actually, my favorite thing, my favorite thing about it is the death saves. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a little bit less, less lethal than I would like, but I absolutely love the fact that you could, rather than going to like negative 10, where you can specifically have the cleric counting down, okay, I've got eight rounds to get to this person. You're like, you know, I, I, I know roughly how many I've got, but he could go at any moment now. <laughs> so that adds a lot of tension to it. Yeah, I ended up like in my, uh, first game which ended up just being the game that i was running because i ran for so long or is still running i had a relatively um i had a relatively for old school like forgiving death system you know and it was kind of maybe more forgiving than i wanted to like you die at negative 10 and you get a certain number of rolls to improve it and it was it, it was in a lot of ways structurally a lot like what they ended up using in 5e so maybe they you know were looking at my shit and maybe they weren't but um what I found, which was interesting, which didn't happen in old school, which would, but was in a certain sense a very old school effect, was that you ended up having this like this unconscious person that you kept having to drag around Vietnam style, like and make sure they weren't like be like, you know, like if the if you know if the dwarf dies, a dwarf dies, and that's like you know okay zero hit points, you're dead. But this is more like like every decision you made for like an hour or half hour would be based on trying to keep this one person alive. You know, you'd be like, he's down, you know, he's wounded. And, and you know, what are we going to do with, you know, Helgar, you know, and that actually was a really interesting effect. And I think that, uh, like properly done, you can have the same thing in five E. Um, and, uh, well, they've got, they've got the, uh, the wounded status, which I think they, the, the, the idea of a status comes over from third, edition but i think it's done considerably better in fifth edition uh than they did it in third yeah i mean there's still like things about it that are 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 
like not how I would do it, but they're so easy to change. You know, you're right that like in 3.5, it was so interwoven. The only hard part, and this goes for every version of D&D, is once you start leveling up, magic gets so, the wizard can just go nuts and be unbelievably powerful unless you build a system and really work with the system that makes fighters crunchy which a lot of fighters don't want to do and it's annoying you know it's like unless you do all the feats and crap you end up with these spells where somebody snaps their fingers at at ninth or tenth level and then well, that's the end of that or you build the adventure specifically around like routing the wizard there's ways to do it but that is the one thing i think is like actually a relatively large structural problem D&D has never solved which is how do you do high level you get the wizards doing all cool wizard shit but you also don't you also have fighters that are effective but they're also not like super complicated fighters that you know you need to be pressing system specific widgets in order to get them to work i've managed like in individual games i've managed to make it work because i know what the wizards have and i know what their spells are and i know how to like build oppositions that make it keep it interesting at like high levels but building that whole game like 90 percent of making any edition of dnd uh just like 90 percent of building a superhero game is writing all those superpowers you know like that's the hard part anybody could make a superhero game if it wasn't for writing all the goddamn powers and anybody could write a dnd if it wasn't for going through that whole spell list and making every single spell work and be interesting even at high levels you know you don't have a fly spell that just makes the game boring all of a sudden and stuff like that and that is like a that's something that they really you know I think that's a that's the next mountain to climb. But, I think, that, yeah. I mean, the way that I tend to do that in my games, not consciously, but I guess, but um, I tend to move into a very uh, multiplanar game um, as we reach higher levels, and the effect of that is it makes the environment uh, usually becomes a threat, and gaining information starts to get weird, and as a result. The wizards uh, have to be using a lot of their spell resources on information gathering during the adventure or uh, staving off some sort of damage or risk in the environment. And so they basically they, they have to go back to the sort of, uh, you know, utility wizard um, and, and defocus more on the combat. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely ways to do it and has been done. But I think solving it for the whole system. So there's sort of like a decent default way to hot play high level is is still a little bit hard like oh yeah yeah no i totally totally agree with you i think that that but if that's the price of having the nice thing about all versions of DD, which is is play changes as you level you know so you can get that like gritty first through third level thing where you're like everyone's just like super paranoid and you can get that sort of like interesting heroic level and you can get the weird planar thing like that's that's a like, that's one of the reasons that they're such complicated games compared to, like, sort of simpler indie systems, you know? Like, World of Dungeons is fucking simple, but you can't do all that. You know, you don't have this game that organically grows that way. And so it's like, you don't, yeah, nobody likes derived characteristics and, like, all these, like, number fidgeting that you end up doing in D&D. But the reason why is so that it grows as you go and you get this game that kind of moves in different directions the longer you play. So you can really have that not just a long epic game but you can also have a game where you can see you don't you don't get bored with your yeah. specific role you know and you have a characters that can if they survive they get to sort of turn into a new kind of thing whereas i noticed like in games that haven't quite figured it out you can play for a really long time but the only thing that happens is the math gets better you know you're just yeah. like i hit things more often and that's like so <laughs> you know like like I think that I'm I haven't played long enough to be sure, but I think that that might start to happen in like the the Warhammer, the new Warhammer games, the war like the 40k ones, you know, like a Rogue Trader and Dark Heresy. It's like the math gets more and more on your side, but I'm not sure the actual kind of play that you're doing changes very much. So uh, yeah, the the Warhammer 40k universe has always had a, a problem, you know, part partly caused by the the setting itself. You know, it just doesn't. Uh, uh, you sort of jump in on the uh, on what in D and D would be the high level spectrum uh, on things, and they they have trouble, you know, working a around that and staying true well, to the original concept. Well, actually, like when you do, like at least in the forty, at least in like uh, like Dark Heresy, you suck in the beginning. You're oh terrible. really okay. Like you, 
because you know there's lots of skills and they're not just like combat skills like you know there's research and awareness and stuff like that and you're at like 20 or 30 percent for most of these things so it's like literally like 20 percent to 30 percent of the time you're like you know like so many times you're like does anyone have tech use you know we live in a technological <laughs> world, but everyone's looking around like nope nope and like we're supposed to be investigators and none of us can even like do like this basic stuff so it's fun because you have to like work around that you know and find different ways like we d recently did a game where so there was like a, a notorious pirate docked in the bay but for legal reasons they couldn't just send in the troops to arrest the pirate we had to get him outside and then get the pirate and so we s and of course every single technological solution that you would do in the 40,000th century we couldn't do because nobody had the right skills you know so we had to like so it was like okay well what's we need an old school plan um and so the plan was um Somebody went in because we were, you know, maintenance was going in and out of there, you know, kind of a Star Trek kind of setup, you know. So maintenance was going in and out of this pirate ship. And so one of the people disguised themselves as maintenance, went in and uh, s and s destroyed the room that had the central plumbing for the ship. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so everybody who eventually everyone would have to leave the ship to go to the bathroom and they were to the starboard. So we just hung out, super creepy, uh, near the bathrooms, <laughs> <laughs> and waited for this, you know, the space pirate to eventually use the bathroom, and then you know, arrested him. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is that game. Actually, you are like there's dazzling technology in psionics, but also like it's still Warhammer, so you start out just incredibly incompetent, you know. I just wonder if, like, as you level up, whether the only thing that slides up is your competence, you know? Like, so you're like, I used to not be able to hit things with a laser gun, and now I can, but that doesn't really change the gameplay that much, you know? So, I mean, psychers are pretty intense in that game, but, uh, so we'll see. I mean, I, I'm only about 10 sessions deep into the, the fan fantasy flight games. Um, oh, another thing I did want to say is, like, about Fifth Ed being popular, I, okay, so I went out, I live like in the middle of downtown LA. So this is like Raymond Chandler, Bukowski. This is like Blade Runner is based on downtown LA. It's like a very dense area, you know? Um, so I went out and I went to the bar, you know, and uh, I was, this bartender comes over. He's like, hey, are you Zach Sabbath? And I'm like, oh, it's a porn guy, you know? And he's like, and I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I love to hit it with my ax. And I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I started getting a game going after I saw that. Uh, I'm like, well, what are you playing? He's like, oh, we're playing, we're playing the new one, 5th edition. I'm like, how is that going? He's like, it's really cool. Like, I have a bunch of people who aren't playing, and, like, and they, they didn't know anything about the game, and now they're rolling. And I'm like, okay, well, like, that, that happened once in a while, right? Sure, whatever. Yesterday, I went out. I was at the bar, and I was at, I was at a different bar. Completely, This is the oldest bar in L.A. I was around the corner at this bar. And uh, I know the kid there. Like there's this young uh, ish like Mexican kid who's like the Pokemon champion of the bar. Like it, the bar was a Pokemon gym in the Pokemon Go game, and so uh -huh. he's sitting behind the bar while he's supposed to be working. And he would always, uh, he's like, you can see people in the bar playing, and you can see they don't know who they're fighting, but he, they're fighting him. Like he's behind the bar, like you know, he's like, I'm the, I'm, you know. So we, you know, I would joke about that when I go to the bar, like, oh yeah, you're the you're the champ. And you know, he talks about like anime cons and stuff. So he comes in and it's like late at night, the bar's full. And uh, he comes over to me and he's like, how's your game going? Like super loud. And I'm like, oh, I got to talk about games at the bar. So I'm like showing, I'm like, oh yeah, working on Demon City, looking at things. Oh, that's really cool. And the other partner is like, what are you doing working on a game? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, oh yeah, me and my dad are working on a Bronze Age tabletop RPG right now. I'm like, this, like downtown LA is just full of people like playing, like gamers playing fifth edition now, like, like wall to wall. Um, it's super weird um, because you tend to think of this neighborhood as, you know, like like a hip a hip place where that's a, a nerdy, you know, occupation. But it's like so many people are 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 into it. And then like the whole like Harmon Quest and like the you know YouTube, which I'm sure you know about because you're doing YouTube. But it's uh, it is crazy how popular. It is, and I think it's also it's probably just like the age people are at. You know, it's like par parents are now D and D age, and so their kids are, you know, they're they're they want to they want to do something with their kids, and then yeah, yeah. You know, they're like they're people who grew up in the eighties during the most popular era of D and D, 
are like, you know, like, oh, this is something I can do with my 10 year old, you know? Um, and so that's like metastasizing a lot of it. You know, I think though that I have seen, if, if I were to characterize what I'm seeing with fifth edition, it, um, it's not the, um, it's not the children of the Stranger Things generation. It is people who fell in between the Stranger Things generation, um, and the very and the and the young kids now. I mean, it seems to me like it's more um, millennials suddenly starting to pick up D and D as being something to try out, and that's just subjectively what it, you know what the impression I've gotten. Well, there's definitely a chunk of that because I think there's two dynamics at work. One of them is just that they're playing video games and then they go, oh, this is where all this shit came from. You know, like it's very accessible. Like people talk all the time about like how inaccessible like D&D is, but like everyone knows what armor class is and hit points are from playing video games, you know? And they're like, oh, this is where all of those tropes came from. And so it's like when I have a, a new player who's like they've played Skyrim, it's like you don't have to explain anything. You're just like, oh right, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. and that's like one of the most popular AAA games in existence. You know, even if they just play Destiny or something, you're just like, oh yeah, it's that. You know, it's like I'm the computer, and they they adapt immediately. The other part of it, though, I think is that I think people notice this across media. Um, anybody who's doing like people who are working, I know in literature, people who are doing art stuff is there's a real craving for events and scheduled events um, online because there's no longer hanging out at the bookstore, hanging out at the record store. Like to get culture, you no longer need to leave your house. And so people are ordering things and downloading things and they're kind of locked in a little box with their enthusiasms and they get into these things and they're like, oh, I really like anime or whatever, but I don't, I only have online friends, you know? And, you know, I know guys who are running literary magazines and they're like, I'm like, how do you fund this magazine? Like who binds the magazine? And they're like, nobody, but we have events. And then everybody goes to the events because they're like, oh, I've been sitting home reading, you know, like these novels by myself and like being on this like forum book club. And then there's an event. And I think for a lot of people, like a D&D game or any kind of tabletop, including like all the other tabletop games. Okay, sorry about that. You're talking, talking about online events. Yeah, and I was saying like, for a lot of these people, like, you know, board game night or anything is, it's an event. It's the event that's connected to their hobby. And so they're excited. Like, that's the one thing they'll do. Like, I literally have a player who she's, she works in VR. The only time she goes out of the house, not for work, really, at this point, is just to play D&D. Like, okay, so you're talking, you're talking about actual physical events. Yeah. More than online events. Yeah, I think, you know, it's because online culture, like constantly accessing culture online and having access to so much of it creates this thing where you don't have to constantly be outside just to do your thing. You don't have to go, you know, if you want to rare a record, you don't have to go to the record swap, you know? And so it creates this hunger for like organized events that are outside your house that you can actually go do, you know, that need to happen because people do want to get out, you know, like eventually they do. And so, you know, it's the same thing with you see like people going to live podcast tapings, you know, like in the 80s, they had lots of radio shows, but you didn't have people going to live tapings of radio shows. Right. But that's now true. People do it because they sit home and they listen to the podcast all day. And they're like, this is an event. I will meet like minded people. I will leave my house and I will be guaranteed to do something I'm into. So the people who are at home, like getting into like all their nerdy shit are like, shit, I got to get out. You know, and so that is a, you know, and so there's like a weird thirst for like these, this kind of uh, way of doing things, I think. So that definitely is fueling it. Yeah, I, I bet. I, I think you're, you're right about because there's been a, um, a certain, it seems like there's been a growth in conventions, uh, D&D conventions too, which would fall right into that category. Yeah. I mean, you want to like, you know, like, uh, I mean, cosplay, I think is the ultimate expression of this. Like, you're so into anime and you're so into like how these gloves were made. You want to share it. And there's actually no place in your real life where you would ever share it. It doesn't come up. You know, you're like, I'm really good at making golden wings. Like, right. No. I, you know, yeah. There's no place in your whole life where that occurs unless you go to the convention, you know? And so I think that the more that this, uh, that that becomes just the way that life is because you don't have to leave your house to get the stuff that you end up wanting to leave your house in a more 
specific way, you know. Right, because well, and and then a lot of people who who work at home, you know, even yeah. even more so. I want to get out um, on a uh, on a program. That's almost, a, you know? that's a good point. The gig economy creates. Gig, I mean, you know, like I'm a painter, like so I have like whole weeks where I don't leave the house. Like I don't have to. Like I can order food. I can even order groceries and like I could get it, you know, like I can, you know, I, I have meetings without leaving the house, like things that like my dad would have to have left the house 20 times to do, I can do without ever leaving the house. And so, you know, like honestly slotting in, it's kind of like how it's kind of like exercise, like how in the, in the eighties there became a craze for exercising and everyone noticed like, Oh, these joggers, people are going to the gym. And it was because real life was starting to require less and less exercise. You know, just the daily thing of getting around the house, getting around your city had become so easy. And, you know, the labor that people were doing often involved no work. And so you had to kind of, rather than just casually assume it was going to get done, you have to kind of put a little box around it and be like, this is your exercise time. And it's the same thing with this. It's like people used to just have to leave their house to do their life and now you don't and so now people are like okay we need a box and D fits that very well you get your five friends together and you see them and you hang out and you do all the things that people do when they spend time together and you know especially for people who are very poorly socially adapted because they never leave the house you have something to do <laughs> you know you don't have to like generate conversation just without out of your head you can talk about the elves and then well i can i can i can tell you that's been a facet of D D since the uh the day it started so <laughs> <laughs> but it also it's creating more of those people you know what i mean like you're creating yeah, but there's, there's a very famous quote um that i have forgotten but i think it was it was gary gygax talking to somebody and um you know, he just sort of gestured out over a, over one of the early Gen Cons. You know, he said, you see all of these people, you know, talking to each other. You know, they would not have been able to do that without the, uh, you know, the framework. And I've, I've totally mangled whatever the quote was, but right. uh, is a, a no, valid point. It's a, that's a really good point. It's also, I mean, I think the permission aspect is really interesting. For me, like, what I've noticed with people... Like, you know, like a lot of my players are porn actors, porn actresses, and that job is like a super disparate group of people. Like those people, like you, you show up on a set, like on most jobs, people have similar training, similar background, similar something, you know, in porn, they're from all over. Like the guy next to you could be a mercenary, uh, like literally, like I, I was gonna say, the person over here could be like a steamship captain. Like the person over here has never left Utah, you know, like these are just, you know, and so you can see them trying to, contrary to like people's impressions, they kind of have a real hard time talking to each other because they're like, what do we have in common? You know what I mean? So they just like end up talking about like porn stuff. They're like, oh, have you seen so-and-so, you know? And you can see something a little bit hedged because they're, they're not sure of themselves. They're not sure of like what they will say that can be received as uh, as interesting you know like what they that won't bore the person and if you bore people on the porn set and then you have to do a scene with them then you don't have chemistry and you know it's a disaster you know so you can see this sort of like stilted interaction that people have and then you know when i get people into a game even with people they don't know it's like you're okay anything you want to say about elves or like what you think your character looks like you have permission to talk about that like you have total permission and just that is huge you know like people are like oh I'm like, this is a conversation that whatever I say will be received as interesting and uh, given back to me with, you know, input from other, you know, like, and that is like a really, to take people out of the situation where they're constantly socially guessing, they're, they're constantly socially aware that they might fuck something up and put them in a situation where what you say is automatically uh, to the point is yeah. Yeah. a big part of, of games, you know, of RPGs. And I think that, you know, that, that probably can be, you know, you may, you may have one microcosm there where it's especially true, but I think in general, a lot of people have become less um, clear about what their social roles are, especially, you know, as we were talking about, you know, the, com the computerization of the economy and all of this, people are being thrown uh, into contact with people where there's less and less cultural um, uh, commonality between them you know and so you know D D, and i think also video games uh you know the online video games also um you know gave people a format in which they could uh um 
be comfortable with each other, but being comfortable with each other seems to be, have been something that started becoming a real issue. Yeah, I mean, the thing about video games is that, like, if you're unless you're in the same room, you still have that same problem. Like people, you know, like there's the total, like you know, like the the anonymous jerk factor. Is oh yeah, that's true. That is true. Um, I was thinking about just the fact that you know you can talk about you know we're we're going to do a raid. You know, you've got you've got sort of topics that you can talk about. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. See them online. I mean, in real life, it's wonderful actually. Like uh, I do Indiecade once in a while because some of my which is like an independent video game festival, but some of my tabletop stuff has gotten awards in Indiecade. So I've done Indiecade a few years. And it's like all these little independent game designers and they're just, they're so happy. They're so excited. It really is the first time they've got out of, of the thing. And video games, like it's full of just this, you know, all this drama and hate. But in real life, they're all so nice. They just love each other. You know, they're like, oh my God, this thing in Final Fantasy 3 and you did, like, it's just the, the, you know, that, like once you get it detached from you're in real life with the real person and you have permission to talk about Final Fantasy as much as you want. Like, like, wow. Like they're all having their cake and eating it too. And they're, and it's, um, it's really, you know, it's cute. You know, it's, it's, it's like one of the best vibes uh, of a convention I've ever, I, you'll ever go to just cause people are like the sense of appreciating what they have. And I think it's probably true at all conventions really. All the maybe maybe to a lesser or greater extent. I think some conventions have that, and and some you know do something else. You know, because like you know, I go to North Texas Con where there's it's very much like a family feeling because there's it's been so small and so many people coming back that it's almost like a family gathering. So it's um, you know, yeah, there is that sort of jo joy in what's going on, but there's also an almost separate con from the convention thing of, you know, here, here I am with all my friends again. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there are, there are dangers in that, you know, when it starts to be, I mean, there's good and bad things about family. I think everybody knows that, you know, when it starts to be about uh, a group of people rather than you're just assuming, like discovering, I think the first time was when you first discover that they're, you know, that you're allowed to have these conversations is, uh, is really magical. And I think that, you know, once you get into the group dynamics, then it's a group and with group dynamics and that's life, you know, like they're all going to be different and they're all going to be kind of going their own ways. But yeah, no, that's, that I mean, moment, that's... and I think that a lot of people right now are in that moment. They're in that moment of discovering that they have people. Like I went to the bar and the bartender is like, Oh, me and my dad are making a bronze age D and D like game. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I wrote three D and D games. And he was like, Oh yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like he's the happiest bartender in the world, you know, cause he's been just talking to people about the last time they got arrested and like, you right. Know, sure. Like that's what he's been doing all day. And, you know, and it's funny, you know, it's like, but people are discovering that they have people, you know, which is, which is great. Yeah. I think that's, uh, uh, that, that's definitely something that's going on right now. Let's, and, and in fact, on that note, um, people discovering that they have people, uh, let me go ahead and, and bring this one, uh, to a close. And, uh, so I'll give it my, uh, I'll give it my sign off line. But first, Zach, say bye to your fans. Goodbye to my fans and also to Matt's fans and to anybody <laughs> else. everyone hate watching. Goodbye. Goodbye. We will, and I will say whatever sort of D&D &D it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it.